All right, so here we go with video number two. This one we're going to center in on giving an introduction to the macromolecules and how they get formed, and then we're going to start getting into some of the specifics behind carbohydrates. So to give a, an overview of the, the macromolecules, remember that we talked about in the last video that you can take many smaller pieces and put them together to make larger pieces. And that's really what organic chemistry is all about. So you take these small organic molecules, you join them together, and you can form much larger molecules, similar to what um, you saw in biology class with carbohydrates and uh, proteins and things of that sort. Nucleic acids is another good example. So the macromolecules are the large molecules composed of thousands of covalently connected atoms. Uh, just to give you a breakdown here, um, the prefix of macro means uh, very large. And so we're talking about very large molecules. Now, uh, we're also talking about stuff inside the cell. So in terms of relative size, they're large. In terms of actual size, uh, we, we would probably consider them to be uh, quite small. So um, here we go. <clears throat> you can see an old school computer image here. These are people that are uh, appear to be working on figuring out the structure of various proteins that make up um, certain substances. And so when we're looking at this, all these macromolecules are really uh, what we call a polymer. A polymer is nothing more than a, a long molecule that consists of many of the similar, uh, similar building blocks called monomers. Um, best analogy I can think of for polymers and monomers, a polymer is like the entire puzzle. You take all those little tiny pieces that make up the puzzle, and uh, when you have all of them put together, you have something that has a little bit different meaning than just the individual pieces. And so the polymer is like the full puzzle. The monomer would be the same thing as the pieces that make up the puzzle. And once again, you can look at the uh, word groups to be able to figure out what the meaning of these terms are. Poly meaning many, so you have many things co combined together. Mono meaning one, so it's just one of the little pieces that get combined together to make the polymer. The best examples of polymers in our body are the carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids. Today we're going to concentrate on the carbohydrates, and then tomorrow we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about the proteins and uh, the nucleic acids. And then we'll talk lipids too, but that one shouldn't take us very long. All right. So when we're talking about monomers making larger molecules, there's a name for the reaction in which this happens. We call it uh, a condensation reaction. Um, you can also call it a dehydration reaction. They're the same thing. Right? And I typically, you'll hear me use the term dehydration because it helps you to remember exactly what's going on. When we talk about dehydration, I'm assuming you guys can figure out that dehydration is dealing with the loss of water. And in fact, in the dehydration uh, reaction, a water molecule gets lost in the process. And I'll show you a video here that shows that here in just a moment. Uh, when you're breaking down the polymers into smaller parts, so for instance, when the body's digesting food, it's taken those large carbohydrates, those large proteins, things we've taken into our body, and when those get broken down into smaller parts, that's a process called hydrolysis. And so hopefully uh, when you see the word hydrolysis, it makes you think of hydrogen and hopefully uh, starts leaning it towards water. Water, once again, is involved in the process of taking these large molecules and breaking them down into smaller molecules. And um, therefore, hydrolysis is the exact opposite of dehydration. I have two animations I'm going to show you with this. We'll start with this one. Most biological molecules are very large and are built by assembling small molecules, or monomers, into long chains. The resulting molecules are called macromolecules, or polymers. A process of linking monomers, called dehydration synthesis, involves the removal of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom to form water. One way this might happen is diagrammed here, where several generic monomers are shown with OH groups that could be used for linking. The animation illustrates the joining together of monomers by dehydration synthesis, catalyzed by a polymerase enzyme, and the reverse process, in which added water results in hydrolysis, catalyzed by a hydrolase enzyme. And the little squiggly thing that came in here to do that, that was nothing more than an enzyme. We'll, we'll talk about enzymes when we get into proteins, and that's going to be the, the topic of our first lab. I have another animation that I think shows, <coughs> excuse me, 
shows us a little bit better. Um, and you know what? I'm not going to be able to show that because it's going to get mad at me when I um, try to exit this. I'll I'll show that other one for you guys uh, when I come back. We'll kind of use that as an opener, and we'll get into it then. So sorry about that. All right. So this diagram kind of breaks down what's going on as well. You have these short polymers when you want to combine them together to make a long polymer. You notice the hydrogen end of one of them will come off the hydroxide end will come off the other one. When you combine a hydrogen and hydroxide, you get a water molecule out of it. Therefore, since a water molecule is leaving as a result of this reaction, we call it dehydration. All right. You call it hydrolysis then when you take this large molecule and you break it down. You're going to use water to help break down those bonds. And then the hydroxide, the water will break down into hydroxide and hydrogen, and the hydroxide will attach to one of the pieces, and the hydrogen will attach to the other, depending in depending upon what polymer it is that you're trying to break down into smaller parts. Alright, so there's thousands of different kinds of macromolecules. Granted, they're all put into uh, three or four classifications in the or carbohydrates, proteins, things of that sort. But when you take all the different versions of those, you can combine those together to make up thousands. <coughs> Alright, and the macromolecules are going to vary among different organisms. They're going to vary among the species. They're going to vary in, vary in between species because Proteins are one of these macromolecules, and the reason why you have the appearance that you have and why everything has the appearance that it has is because of proteins being made uh, as a result of um, polymerization. All right, and so there's a whole bunch of, there's a variety of polymers that can be built from just that small set of monomers. And it's kind of like a, um, the vortex sets that are out there now, where you have all these pieces and you can put them together in whatever ways you want to or Legos would be another example. You can take these Legos and you can construct all kinds of different things using the same building blocks. And so when we talk about macromolecules, you're talking about the same thing. Taking one set of ingredients and being able to make multiple things out of it. Alright, so carbohydrates. The whole reason why your body needs carbohydrates is because it acts as the fuel source for your body as well as for other organisms and it acts as a building structure within organisms as well. You know, so things like sugars, those are classified as carbohydrates. And sugars are nothing more than polymers of smaller sugars. I'm going to look more specifically here in a few minutes at some of the different types of sugars that there are. The simplest of the sugars are what we call the monosaccharides. Um, playing with word roots because I'm going to warn you guys that's all biology is all about. Once you start to figure out all those word roots and everything, it makes this topic a lot easier. Mono, once again, means one, like we already discussed. Saccharide is the term that we use for sugars. So this is a one part sugar. So it's a simple sugar, a single sugar. All right. Um, the one that you're probably going to be most familiar with is going to be glucose, the one that we talked about extensively in uh, your first biology class. Carbohydrates are typically polysaccharides. So once again, break, breaking down those words, we got sugar, poly meaning many, so it's a combination of many sugars that have been combined together to form a polymer. Alright, so the monosaccharides have molecular formulas. Typically, they're going to be in this ratio. For every carbon, there's two hydrogens and one oxygen. Now think about glucose. Glucose was C6H12O6. Gets that, um, fits that ratio pretty well. So like I said earlier, glucose is the most common of the monosaccharides. And just because it is the primary fuel source used by almost all organisms to drive the processes that they need uh, for cell respiration. And so, you're going to hear about glucose over and over and over again. Um, it's used to help re-energize the, the ADP molecule to make it back up into ATP. And we'll talk about that when we get into cell respiration. And it's involved in many other pieces. Some of the other molecules that we did not discuss when we were in regular biology will bring into, into play this go around too. Alright, so the monosaccharides are typically classified in the world of organic chemistry based upon where the carbonyl group is attached to it. And I'm not too concerned about the, the naming portion right now. Let's concentrate on the, the structural and um, fuel purposes rather than the uh, how to name it parts. All right, so here's some of the examples of the different types of sugars. 
Like I said, I'm not worried about you being able to recognize all these different little names. Um, I would like you to be familiar with being able to identify some of those functional groups that we talked about. So here you can see we've got a carboxyl group hanging on it. Same thing down here. And so carboxyl groups are going to be the things that are primarily associated with your different uh, sugars. <coughs> so monosaccharides, the reason why these are so important is, like I said just a minute ago, these are the major fuel cells. Uh, they're, excuse me, the major food that's used for, for cells and major fuel used for cells. All right, so different forms that your, uh, this is just showing the different forms that your sugars can take. Many of your sugars are going to have more of a ring structure. So remember we talked about C6, H12, O6. And so you don't necessarily find it in a straight chain. You instead find it in the form of a ring structure. When you're looking at these ring structures, one thing I want you to be able to notice is you can see how it's a pretty, you know, thin line, thin line, thin line, all the way around, and then it gets thick right here. The thick is used to help show you where uh, double bonds uh, may come into play, even though this one isn't necessarily set up that way. So I guess I should take that back with this one. Because uh, the numbers here just try to show you the relationship to where the carbon is. All right, so going on with this. So simple sugars can, are often the things that are combined together to form um, bigger sugars. Some of the more common sugars out there are the disaccharides. These are formed when dehydration reaction happens that causes two monosaccharides to be combined together. All right. Um, so more terminology you should be <coughs> excuse me that you should be familiar with is what a glycosidic um, linkage is. A glycosidic linkage is nothing more than a, a covalent bond inside of a inside of a sugar. So disaccharides you're going to just going to take two monomers you're going to combine them together into one. Check out this little animation there. Sometimes organisms link sugar molecules in pairs to form disaccharides. Here are several examples. Plants make sucrose by joining glucose and fructose. Sucrose circulates in plant sap, and we obtain it from sugar cane and sugar beets and use it as table sugar. Lactose is formed by joining galactose and glucose. Lactose is the disaccharide that gives milk its sweet taste. Maltose consists of two linked glucose molecules. Digestion of starch in a sprouting seed or in the intestine of an animal produces this disaccharide. So what I hope you notice in each of the situations here when it brought these two together, you should have seen that little water molecule leak out of it to show that you had dehydration going on when you were bringing these two um, monosaccharides together. So you can hopefully see it's disaccharide because of the fact that you have two, di meaning two, you have two sugars that have come together to form it. Sucrose, this is the stuff that you guys poured on your Cheerios and the stuff that's in all your your energy drinks and uh, other garbage that you bring into your bodies, even though a lot of that garbage tastes really good, like uh, Tom's Donuts. Um, lactose, this is going to be the, the sugar that you're finding in your milk. So when you hear about somebody being lactose intolerant, what that means is, is their body does not have the ability to break this down into monomers anymore, and therefore uh, you don't get the glucose, or excuse me, you don't get the glucose out of the molecule that your body can then turn around and use. And as a result of this getting in your digestive tract and not being um, absorbed or broken down and then absorbed, it causes some of the symptoms of lactose intolerance that uh, often involves uh, gas production. All right, and then you have maltose. So if you're into chocolate malts, things of that sort, this is the sugar that's used in making your, making your malts. All right, so once again, you can see in the dehydration synthesis, the water mouth is going away. And in the end, it caught, as a result of that, the two monomers are able to bond together to form your disaccharide. All right, polysaccharides, these are going to be polymers of sugars uh, that are used for more storage and structural purposes. Um, so the main function of these is, is going to be determined by the sugar's monomers 
and where those glycosidic uh, linkages occur, so where those covalent bonds between the monomers occur. Uh, so now let's take some time, let's look at some of the more important structural sugars that are necessary for living organisms. <coughs> Sorry again. All right, starches are a good example of this. Starches are going to consist, consist of nothing more than uh, glucose. So you take a whole bunch of glucose. If we're talking thousands of glucose monomers, you line them all up, you combine them all together as a result of dehydration, and in the end, that's when you get your uh, your starches. You know, typically starches is, is going to be used by plants as a way for them to be able to store um, excess energy. And you'll often find the starch is located in areas that are close to the chloroplasts or other plasts where um, sugar production is um, a big big thing in that location for the cells. So here you can see the chloroplasts and you can see all kinds of starch being stored. And then this is just showing you the difference. Um, there's many different molecules of glucose being combined together to form the substance. All right, here's another example of a starch. You can see this starch has a different name because of the fact that it bonds in different locations. <coughs> Right, glycogen is another important storage molecule for um, for carbohydrates, for sugars. Uh, this is the one that's going to typically be used in animals. We tend to take the glycogen and store it in our liver, and it often gets stored in muscle cells as well. Most other vertebrates can do the same thing. All right, so once again, glycogen is nothing more than a polysaccharide where a bunch of simple sugars are getting combined together and based upon the, the structural formation of where they get combined together, if it's done in the proper uh, way, you'll form what we call glycogen. You see there's all kinds of linkages here. Cellulose is another important one. This is the one that's primarily found, well, excuse me, it's going to be found in plant cells and is primarily used for making the tough wall of plant cells. This is the thing that gives plants the structure to be able to climb or to be able to grow to be as tall as they are. All right, this is going to be um, your bark is an extension of the cellulose as well. So like starch, this is going to be a polymer of glucose, but what makes it different from starch is the glycosidic linkages that happen. All right, you're going to have them combining in different areas on those carbon chains, which is going to cause you to have um, different structures. And therefore, if you have different structures, you're going to have different primary purposes. And so let's take a look at some of the polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are polymers, long chains consisting of hundreds to thousands of linked monosaccharides. So if you take a look at the starch versus the glycogen, um, you should notice that there are no differences. They're exactly the same. The only difference is starch is what's used by plants. Glycogen is the molecule used by animals. Now, when I say there's no differences, what I mean is in terms of the monomers that make it up. Right? There's going to be different structural things based upon the number of monomers that make it up and where they actually bond into here. If you look at cellulose, though, you should find one primary difference. You can see you've got a geometric isomer here because of the, of the oxygen. There's another one. Okay, we're getting the mirror image here now on this monomer. So you can see there's a little bit more than just structural differences here uh, with cellulose compared to um, starch and glycogen. <coughs> and this is just going through and showing you the same thing that we just looked at. And then I believe for today, no, we're going to keep this going. Some of the different um, isomers of this. They give them the signs of alpha and beta. I, I'm not too concerned about this. I probably should be, but I think we're going to skip this for now. We'll come back to it a little bit later on. So part of the problem, though, in our body is many of us uh, larger organisms do not have the ability to take and break down some of these larger macromolecules. For instance, cellulose. We do not have the ability in our digestive system to take cellulose and break it down into those smaller components. So we can't break the cellulose into the, into the glucose and be able to use it. 
So instead, it just passed right through our digestive tract. It's insolu insoluble. So our body can't do anything with it. However, in many organisms, uh, there's bacteria that live in them, and they live in their digestive tract, and they work in a symbiotic uh, relationship, which means they both benefit from this relationship, both organisms, um, where the, the microbes will go through and break down the cellulose. And so the there might be bacteria, for instance, in the, in the cow's stomach. It's not the cow's stomach that can actually break down the grasses. It's the bacteria that's in those stomach, in the stomach of the uh, cow, excuse me, that is able to break down the, the grass. And then once it gets broken down into those smaller components, into the glucose, the bacteria can turn around and use the glucose, as well as the cow can now go through and be able to use the glucose. And so they're both getting benefits out of this, um, out of this relationship. Therefore, um, there's an advantage for the cows to having those back, uh, particular bacteria in their, in their stomachs. Termites fit under the same uh, under the same boat. Termites do not in their digestive system does not have the ability to break down the cellulose in the wood that they eat. However, the bacteria that live in their uh, digestive systems those do. Right, and so you can see here a uh, picture of the bacteria that's in the stomach of the cow that's able to turn around and break down the, the cellulose. One last type of carbohydrate for today is um, one called chitin. All right, this is another structural polysaccharide. This one is one that's primarily found in the exoskeleton of arthropods. So a lot of your insects, you notice on the outside of their bodies, you know, you, you step on certain insects and they make that little, not only a squish sound, but they make that crunch. The crunch sound that you're hearing is the chitin. All right, the chitin um, has a pretty strong structure to it, and therefore uh, you hear that little bit of a snap when you when you step on certain insects. I, it's a structural support mechanism for many types of, of cells, especially cell uh, different types of cells that have cell walls. So many fungi uh, have chitin in them as well. In fact, chitin is such a good um, strong substance that we often use it as surgical thread. And there's another advantage to us using it as surgical thread it is the fact that this stuff naturally breaks down over time. So when you hear about the soluble surgical threads, the ones where you don't have to go through and have your stitches taken back out, chances are it was made out of chitin, and then the, the thread is just naturally breaking down over time. And so you can see here um, some couple arthropods that have Chitin, you can see, you look at the body, you can see that it appears to have a, an outer covering. That outer covering is most likely made out of chitin. In fact, in this, in this case, with both these organisms, it is certainly made up of chitin. All right, and then you can see the, the uh, taking that, isolating it, and turn around and using it in surgical thread. All right, and that's all I have for today. So, um, for the remainder of the block, what I'd like you guys to work on is I'd like you to work on, you can go work on your blogs. So you can update your blogs. And you remember, you have a new entry for the week you're supposed to be doing. You can go through and make comments to other people's blogs. You have um, the study guide you can work on. I, I thought I gave you guys copies of the carbohydrate study guide. In case I didn't, there's new copies that are available. And then if you happen to be getting ahead, you can go through and print out the other ones for yourselves as well. And then I would like for you guys to read the rest of Chapter 5 um, before you come to class on Thursday. And then Thursday, that will make it so we can go through the lipids and proteins portion a little bit more quickly. And then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to start talking about your first lab. All right. I look forward to seeing you guys on Thursday. Sorry I wasn't there again today.